Thank Deborah, you. Deborah, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> you were not here just a moment ago, but I was struck by that very real emotion at the end by Senator Bill Cassidy in asking why this issue is personal for him, and I think that's why we're here, because it is personal for everyone. So, Congresswoman, thank you for joining us. I, I want to begin on the issue of the very real inequities in underserved communities, nursing homes, among veterans, among, among those incarcerated. Why did we get to this point? Why are they underserved? And then I want to get to the solutions, but first, how did, how did we get to this problem today? Basically, I think we got to this problem because we tried to ignore it. Um, we translated certain behaviors that we saw as troubling, um, as criminalizing, et cetera, as opposed to a function of uh, a mental illness, of poverty, impoverishment, racism, um, sexism, and all those other isms that have a negative impact on how you feel about yourself. So I believe that we got to this point because as a country, we've lagged behind in, in, in terms of prevention, cultural competence, uh, outreach, diversity, and resource application. I think that the last two years or so with the pandemic sort of highlighted stuff that we saw happening even before the pandemic started. I remember uh, before the pandemic, just looking at Facebook every day, and I would see these postings from parents and other people about young black uh, children, boys and girls, five years old, nine years old, 11 years old, attempting suicide or succeeding. And I'm like, what is going on here? How does anyone that young think that that's a solution to their living at such a young age. And so that's how we started our task force, by trying to examine what's going on in our communities, in our environment. And as we searched through um, the hearings and the meetings and the approaches that were coming at us, we recognized that we have a serious problem in the underserved communities a serious lack of service, a lack of um, people working in that space who were not, it's not necessarily whether or not you're culturally competent, but whether or not you understand and are culturally empathetic mm -hmm. and can work in that space. Um, we weren't putting the kind of resources into programs, educational programs, that would ensure that we were incentivizing people who needed to work in that space to work in that space. And we didn't think that the kind of um, research was being done, being considered, even sort of the pers perspectives that were sent to our various agencies weren't really understood enough to put the resources into the kind of research that we needed, kind of answers that we needed. Um, so I am really, uh, I've been working with Otsuka. I mean, it's exciting that Otsuka partnered with Morehouse and, and, and this particular uh, report came out. But from the time we created the Emergency Task Force on Mental Health for, and Suicide for Young uh, Black Children, Otsuka has kind of been in that space with me. And I think that this country in general, if you look at what's being proposed in the labor, health, and human services part of the appropriations bill, you see that there's a lot more money that is being targeted for mental health services, for research, for outreach, for destigmatizing, for reaching out to underserved communities. And we got to get the bill passed, you all, um, and signed in, into part of, part of our law. But we're paying attention now, but we're, we're paying catch up. I was you know, familiarized with certain parts of um, the Morehouse um, plan that said, not only is this costing us uh, socially, is it negatively impacting our society, and we are losing hundreds of thousands of people to deaths that, that were, could have been prevented, but it's also you know, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. that we're losing as a result of this. And so it is something that um, the, the nature of the times, the nature of poverty, 
the nature of racism, the uh, systematic barriers that exist. All these things contribute to why we are where we are today. But I think that we're moving in the right direction in terms of applying resources and attention to these issues in general and in underserved communities. But let me add another element that I might argue is compounding everything that you outlined here. And this is not the role of the federal government, but it is the role of parents in society. And that's our culture, our music, our entertainment, and how all of that compounds everything that you just indicated a moment ago for, for, for parents, for teachers, for society, for educators, for employers. Yeah, well, the entertainment industry has always been uh, something that is of interest to me when I watched certain programs that showed you how to kill people. Um, when you listen to certain music and how it sort of demonizes relationships and women and men and other things. Um, but, there, there, but there is a balance. I mean, I've listened to that stuff and I've seen that stuff and you know, I don't think that I have a mental health challenge. I mean, I have times of sadness you know, but I can relate that sadness to situations and people need to recognize the difference between mm -hmm. being sad from time to time, even being depressed from time to time, that is associated with an event or not, as opposed to just having it become part of who you are. Um, feeling, feeling that you don't have solutions to feeling better and not, not getting a handle on why you are feeling the way you are. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, that, that the whole discussion about the words we hear in music and rapping and stuff like that. It's been a discussion that we've had for decades now. But that's not as serious as the lack of resources. That's mm -hmm. not as serious as poverty. That is not as serious as, as, as hatefulism, you know, whether it's anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, um, uh, discrimination against the LGBTQ community, all of those things. Um, dealing with those failures and systemic breakdowns are more significant, I think, in terms of ensuring better mental health than whether or not a kid is listening to, you know, and dancing to a rap artist. Half the time, I can't even understand what the rap artist is saying, <laughs> but then they may, that might be my old ears. Do we discriminate against mental health? Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, you know, we're, we're more enlightened now, I think, than we've been. Um, we use terms like crazy. Uh, we use dismissiveness. We've used it. Um, we think that it is a, that's your problem. You've got a problem. Shame on you. In the black community in particular, you know, we were raised to believe we had Jesus. And so if you got a problem, don't take it to the psychologist, take it to Jesus. But then when we did realize that um, Jesus, Jesus is a resource, but so is a psychiatrist or a psychologist, we couldn't find the He doesn't call you back, right? <laughs> yeah. we, we couldn't find them because less than 3% of um, folks working in that, in that environment are people of color. So... Um, yeah, I think that we've lived for a long time with the stigma associated with the mental health issue. Even families have dealt with it, trying to brush it under the rug, put it in the closet, you know, isolate their, their loved one. But it's real. And um, it is an illness. And if we had a, an injury with our knee, we'd go to an orthopedist. And if we're having an injury that stemming from our brain, we need to be able to, to deal with it and recognize it for what it is. But we were talking to Senator Cassidy, and I'd be curious to find out what you're seeing in your state, in your district, which is this cycle, especially among the underserved, the minorities, the poor, who have parents who go to jail, the kids get incarcerated, and that just leads to generations of problems. Mental health is one of the huge underlying currents of that. Yeah, so what you're speaking to is institutional persistent and systemic racism. Who's, who, is it, who represents the over-incarcerated? 
who, who represents the communities of separated families? Where do you find the majority of poverty and underserved communities? Where do you find educational systems that are having to deal with uh, uh, the social problems, the nutrition problems, the uh, uh, problems with sheltering? Uh, where do you find that? You find that in the poorer communities. So yeah, we've got a massive task. We've got to unpack a lot. We've got to unpack a lot of historic dis deprivation, systemic de deprivation, in order to recognize that we are treating the problem uh, wherever we find it equally. And that we are not, we are translating behavior in a way that isn't racist in and of itself. You know, you go to an urban school and you see more um, resource officers than you do counselors. That is a paradigm that doesn't work. You need counselors. You need teachers to be trained to see behavior and look beyond what's happening that moment to see what could be causing that. Um, and we haven't been doing that. We've been uh, setting kids into juvenile justice systems, um, recognizing that or, or, or saying, okay, well, their dad's in jail, so you can expect the least among them. We don't have the right to expect the least among them. We have the responsibility to provide them the resources to be healthy as we figure out our system that has resulted in this over-incarceration and this uh, over-unemployment as it relates to the underserved and black community. So. We had our work to do on so many different levels. And all of it, all of it plays into our sense of well-being or not so well-being. But I'm wondering if the solution, I mean, it, as you look at the problem, it, compounding all of this, you've got the gun violence, you've got the drug abuse, you've got the physical abuse often of, of older individuals abusing a, a spouse or a loved one. So it, you're coming at this on so many different levels. You want to deal with the mental issues, but it's so much more. Well, my side of the aisle, we try to deal with things like the gun safety issue. We recognize that um, g uh, guns are a problem in our community, that uh, danger, deprivation, lack of jobs, um, a, a, a hopelessness is a problem in the underserved communities. But let us not um, automatically align the kind of gun issues with mental health issues. Now, they, I don't think that they're mutual. I think that there's a problem with someone who will take a gun and kill people, an individual or 30 people. But I don't want us to say that that's just an illustration of the mental health issues in this country. That's, you know, th that's a whole different dynamic. I mean, we could say Vladimir Putin has, is mental health deprived. We could say terrorism is a mental health deprivation. It's something else, it's mm -hmm. evil. And so we need to be able to identify and deal with evil. So let's talk about the public-private partnership and some of the solutions. What's working? What can OSCA do in a private partnership with the federal government and communities to try to better address these inequities? Well, SUCA has done, uh, it's doing a good job of uh, raising the issue, elevating the need for more uh, support for the discovery of therapies and medications and things of that nature and the fact that we have this problem. Government has to listen to and not Sukkah, but it has to listen to communities also. It needs to listen to the researchers in various communities of what needs to be studied, what needs to translate in terms of outreach, um, services, health, health care. The lack of, a lack of access to decent health care is a huge issue. The lack of access to people who are competent to work in this, these areas of mental health very serious issues. We need to be putting money into education. We need to be putting money into um, uh, medicines and therapies and outreach. And we need to be teaching um, schools and even, even faith-based communities what to look for in the communities that they serve on a regular basis um, so that 
we can do the kind of referral uh, that would be appropriate to help someone get on the right footing. So it's, it's an issue of resources, the application of resources, and listening to the communities and know what the problem is, respecting those communities and recognizing that for, for decades now, we've not been putting the resources into the underserved communities or the research that is necessary to determine how to over, overcome uh, some of these uh, very serious and very important issues in our communities. We are now, mm -hmm. we're trying. I mean, there, I, I looked, you know, there's like almost a billion dollars that's going in just in this um, F FY23 um, budget. There's money in other bills tackling certain aspects of the mental health uh, issue of, of the lack of services or the lack of research or the lack of outreach or the, the lack of training um, or supporting uh, educational opportunities. There is a serious commitment right now to dealing with this issue. We just need to make sure that those resources are used where they're most needed. And I understand all of that, and you've talked at a very high and important level. I'm wondering on a more granular level, as you travel through your district, which is more urban in New Jersey, is there, is there an example of what's working? Is there a lesson that, that this group can take away from what you've seen firsthand? Well, federal, federally qualified health centers in, in communities are really vitally important. Um, having access to, to health care in your community, in your surroundings, in environments that you feel safe and comfortable in going to. Uh, there, are, there are small uh, nonprofit organizations that try to, to provide opportunities to, for, for children in particular uh, to, to congregate and to, to, to learn how to live a healthy life. I think nutrition pays a, uh, plays a part in this. I just think that this is a whole of society issue mm -hmm. and that we need to, from the highest level of federal government to the partnerships that we do with the for-profits and even the non-profits to the uh, organizations and associations that are on the ground, we need to be setting up networks where we catch issues, we catch the problem and address the problem head on. Um, when we see it, not when it becomes, blows up to become a collective problem, but when it's still that individual problem. And families, families need to be supported. Fam There's no such thing as um, health care, access to health care being a privilege. It is a right, and it is important for your safety and security and well-being as much as it is for the, the family that needs access to it. because. As the least among us gets lifted and protected and can de depend on a decent way of life, then we all benefit. And but I think we got to remember that. We remember that from the top down when we give the very, very mega wealthy all these tax breaks and tax loops, loopholes. But whenever we try to lift up from the very, very bottom, then we start talking about this is ridiculous that we're handing out um, money to these poor people. That's why I support things like guaranteed um, income and uh, guaranteed access to health care and things of that nature because I know it works. You give families the resources to take care of their own and they will. And if they can take care of their own, you have safer communities. You have healthier communities. You have a healthier society. But it's more than just the federal government. A key partner, but more than that is what I hear you say. Oh, absolutely. It's partnerships. It's partnerships. And it's good corporations that recognize also that they need a workforce that's going to be able to make them richer and produce their products and take care of their business. So they should be uh, community investors as well. So final point, when you hear the figure that Deborah talked about uh, over a four-year period, 2016 to 2020, 
an estimated savings of close to $300 billion and more than 117,000 lives potentially saved. When you hear those numbers, your response is what? What a missed opportunity. What a missed opportunity, but we're glad that the research has been done, that the study produces this information, and that it is, it is accepted and understood and legitimately received by all parties. That we're discussing it here today, that we discuss it on the Hill, we discuss it in the Appropriations Committee on which I serve, um, that it helps us to visualize that it's not just wrong or right, it is about the cost to taxpayers. So you want to invest in mental health uh, solutions because it is a better use of your tax money and it'll be less of a drain. And I think you always got to, there are people that you can only talk to about counting costs. So there is a cost. There's a human cost, of course. There's a financial cost. So we can deal with it, create an environment where we have less of it, and create an environment where we see it, we deal with it, and at the end of the day, the cost both socially and financially will be, will be less. Final question. If it is Speaker Kevin McCarthy in a Republican-controlled House, a divided Congress, is this issue bipartisan? The issue is bipartisan. The question that you need to ask Kevin McCarthy, is he willing to work in a bipartisan manner on the issue? I haven't seen so much of that yet. And that's unfortunate. You're skeptical. I'm optimistic that we're going to be in the majority and that we don't have to worry about <laughs> Kevin McCarthy being the speaker. That's what I'm optimistic about. Congresswoman, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you for having Appreciate me. It. Real pleasure. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much.